Hello and welcome to Sunday worship for this morning. We are pleased that you're able to join us. Let us commence with the call to worship. Let us sing praises for the wonders of God. Let us give thanks for the works of God. Let us rejoice in the love of God. Let us worship in the presence of God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come, young and old, from different places and diverse backgrounds to offer this time of worship to you. Help us to focus our thoughts on you that we experience afresh from your grace, mercy and love as fresh gifts in our lives. We praise you for blessing us in this way and for revealing your love in Jesus Christ. With his endless love flowing through us and the Holy Spirit guiding us, may our love for you and all you created never cease. God, source of loving kindness and strength, we worship you. Jesus, foundation of our faith, we worship you. Holy Spirit, ground of our very being, we worship you. Amen. Let us now pray the prayer of confession. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious, gift-giving God, you call us to live out our faith in ways which honour you and bless our neighbours, and we recognise that worship is an essential part of our faith journey. We believe that what we do here in worship does shape our daily witness to Jesus, whose disciples we profess to be. We know that our faith is most visible when we live by your kingdom values of love, justice and peace. Yet it is increasingly hard to resist becoming absorbed with the values of the world. Values dominated by money, profit and production. Forgive us when we fail to understand that planting seeds of faith and love point to the treasures of your kingdom being found and shared. We pray that our hearts will be shaped and reshaped by the unveiling of your kingdom, O oh God, and that our accountability as disciples of Christ will be evident in our worship, our witness, and our service. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us celebrate the assurance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so I declare to you all, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please open up your scriptures or follow with me as I read Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed through the likeness to his son, and that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. 
Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. May God have his blessings on these words and may we take these words as they are written for us. Amen. I'd like to call Johnson now to come and deliver the sermon for today. May God bless you. Good morning, church. We want to thank you for listening to the Word of God. We want to thank you for your commitment. We want to thank you for supporting uh, and encouraging us as you come to hear the Word of God. Let us um, pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the love you have for us. We, we thank you that you are God and everything you have provided us with. We, we thank you that uh, you are always there for us. Father, as we come before your throne, especially today, we want to thank you as we are gathered in our homes, listening to the word of God. Father, we pray that you continue to help us and to guide us in everything that we do. You are God of love. Today we pray for the nations of the world and their leaders and growing tension and accusation, mistrust. We give thanks for those who are pulling their resources to find a vaccine for the coronavirus. For those offering sanctuary to refugees. We remember and pray for those countries where we have family and friends and all those places where suffering touches our hearts. Father, we pray that you continue to help us. We pray for those industries hardest hit economically, for all who are struggling with self-worth and after losing their jobs, for young people applying for universities, for those applying for benefits, for charities struggling to cope with increased demand and reduced income. We pray for churches and places of worship as they welcome congregations back for courage as they encounter new challenges and joy as they embrace new opportunities. We pray for one another as we reflect on the parables and live our faith. Be with us, Father, as we are gathered before you. In your name I pray. Amen. This morning, I uh, do welcome you as I'm going to share with you from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. And my theme is God's most troubling promise. God's most troubling promise. We come now to the new purpose of God. If Romans is the greatest book of the Bible, and chapter 8 is the high watermark, then verse 28 is the pinnacle. We are taking a closer look at this most popular verse. We are going to find out why it is so popular and how we can apply it to our lives. What you might discover is that this verse doesn't mean that what you think it means 
or it means a lot more than you think it means. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. This is probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. It is also one of the most misused and abused verses of the Bible. Some people read this verse and interpret it to mean everything happens for a reason. God has caused all things to happen for a good reason. Quite often this verse is said in the context of difficult or adversity. We get bad news, we are disappointed. Life takes a bad turn and we have a well-meaning friend to say to us. Everything happens for a reason. That's what people would say to us. Sometimes it comes in another form, God must be testing you. Or it must be God's will. Or if things don't happen to you, they happen for you. All of these religious phrases often come out of misunderstanding of Romans 8 verse 28. All things weigh together for God, but my interpret this verse that all suffering is God's will. Do we really believe that God has orchestrated all the pain and tragedy in our lives? And if this is true, what does it say about the God we believe in? It is beyond me how some people read the same Bible I do and follow the same Christ that I follow can believe that God would orchestrate unspeakable tragedy and pain in life. It is beyond me how some people believe that the same God who personified himself in Christ and put little children on his knee would kill children with cancer, teenagers through car accidents, and wipe out families with tornadoes, COVID-19, earthquakes, hurricanes. It is beyond me. It is appealing theology in some ways. There is comfort for many people in believing that in any church, no matter how awful and loving God is, some are working to their good. And many scriptures lend themselves to that interpretation, but not all. And it would be very difficult to believe that God would cause something like the tragic death of an innocent child in order somehow to teach us a lesson. What kind of God would do that? So do we teach these words altogether? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We have been called according to his purpose. Not at all. They are ways of encouragement and faith. But we must deal with them in terms of whole Bible and our own experience. First of all, we need to affirm that we live in a world of natural law. This is how creation functions as well as it does. For example, we can always count on the law of gravity to keep us from floating off into space. That law will never fail us. At the same time, we can also count on the law of gravity to kick it when we step off the roof of a high building. The law of gravity will pull us very painfully and probably fatally to the ground below. It is a painful lesson to learn, but we would not live one day on earth if the law of nature were suspended even for a moment. God has created us and placed us in a wonderful, lawful universe. We should celebrate that truth every day of our lives. That's why we have hair to breathe air to breathe and food to eat. That is why we are able to drive our cars or our long highways. That is why the sun comes each morning and sets in the evening. Jesus affirmed this principle in Luke 13, verses 1 to 5. Listen to these words. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no. On those 18 who died when the Tower of Ceylon fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. We live in a wonderful world, a beautiful, abundant world. But sometimes things happen. Sometimes we can figure out why they happen. Sometimes we cannot. They just happen. Friends, everything does not happen for a reason. At least not in the way people usually mean that phrase. The God I know and love would not plot and plan suffering and tragedy. Sometimes things happen because of the foolishness of others. Sometimes things happen because of our own bad choices. Many of the tragedies that occur in life are a simple consequence of the natural order. 
Someone is driving too fast in a car and tries to negotiate a cave and there's a tree and the law of nature says there's going to be a crash. God didn't cause that accident. Others, otherwise, would be a bunch of robots programmed to love and there's real no such thing as false love. If God took away our freedom to do bad, you would also be taking away our freedom to do good. So the shadow side to a world with free will is that there is room for bad choices, mistakes, bad timing and decisions, all of which can cause pain, difficult, frustration, tragedy and adversity. But when bad things happen, it doesn't mean God caused them to happen. Here's the second thing we need to see. Our perspective on these events will determine how successful we are handling them. In other words, our faith will determine how well we deal with the sometimes tragic events that occur in everyone's life. Notice that St. Paul says, And we know that in all things God works for the good, for those who love him. For those who love him. Of course, the big question is, if not everything happens for a reason, if God is not behind my tragedy and difficult, then how do I deal with it? How do I make sense of it? If so much of the pain I experience in life is based on the free will of others and the free will of the world, then how am I to be prepared for when it comes? How am I supposed to handle it? Where is God when it hurts? Where is God when planes crash and earthquakes come and people die in car accidents? Where is God when people are shot and killed at nightclubs? Where is God in, and is he involved at all? And if Romans 8.20 does not mean that everything happens for a reason, then what does it mean? How do we make sense of this verse? I want us to take a closer look at the verse in its context. As we do, I believe we will receive some answers we are so desperate for. Like many popular verses of scripture, this one is misunderstood because it is taken out of context. So the passage appears in the book of Romans. In Romans, Paul is addressing a group of Christians who are familiar with adversity. They have been persecuted for their faith and in every imaginable way. They also dealt with the disappointments of life that all of us share. Paul helps them make sense of their suffering by articulating where God is in all of it. In chapter 8, Paul encouraged the Romans Christians in their suffering by reminding them that they will one day when there will be no more suffering. When Christ comes again, everything in this world will be renewed and healed. Paul tells us that creation grows with labor and pains. For this day of ultimate renewal and healing, Paul acknowledged suffering not as God's will, but as the effect of life. But he said, we wait with hope that one day the grace and the power of all suffering in the world will cease. We pick up Paul's encouragement ways in verse 26 of Romans 8 as he begins to speak of our prayer life in the midst of suffering. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought to, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for ways. And God who searches the heart knows that what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit prays on our behalf. It intercedes. Paul is saying that when we are weak and suffering, life is turned upside down, we don't know what to pray for. We are not God. Life is crazy sometimes and we don't always know how to pray. Sometimes a sigh is all we can get out of it. And I understand that. Most of my prayers during this COVID period have been sighs. How about you? But the great thing Paul says is that God knows what we need. The Holy Spirit within us senses our yearnings at the deepest level and lifts up our prayers to God. It is then that Paul gives us this verse. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What Paul is saying is that I know you are suffering and nothing makes sense and even your prayers don't make sense. But know this, God knows what you need. And more than that, God is going to work something good out of it. 
He is going to take this awful thing and do something extraordinary within it. He is going to take what is ugly and make it beautiful. How do I know? How do we know this is what Paul means? Take a look at what Paul says a few verses later. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. So God makes you a conqueror over things that are against you, over the things you are fighting. Is that right? If suffering is the will of God, why would God give you strength to conquer it? That wouldn't make sense. By God's power, we are more than conquerors through suffering in life. But what does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Take a look. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8 verse 38 and 39. So for Paul, being more than a conqueror means we are always equipped with the powerful, sustaining and transforming love of God. So this means that no matter how dark your life gets, no matter how painful or disappointing life becomes, God's love will always be there to sustain you and empower you. You can handle anything in life because God is always with you. Wherever you are, whatever you are going through, whatever pain you are in, God carries your sorrows. He shares it with you. He carries cries with you. He acts with you. He loves you too much for you to deal with it alone. So that's why he intervenes. You see, Jesus' death tells us that when we suffer, God suffers with us. That is what the cross and the resurrection is all about. God suffers when we suffer. And he has the power to redeem our suffering. That's what Paul meant when he said, we are more than conquerors. You see, God is not only with us in the midst of our pain. He not only helps us carry our pain. He not only helps us get through it, but he helps us to be more than conquerors. How is that possible? How can we more than conquer our pain, difficulty, and adversity? Here's the answer. We know that all things work together for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. This means that suffering and tragedy is never God's will. But God can take what is ugly in our lives and make it beautiful. That is what makes us more than conquerors. So here is today's message. Here is, here is one way to look at Romans 8, 28. Everything that happens to you is not God's will. But God has a will in everything that happens to you. God has a will to turn your trouble into triumph. That is the story of the Bible. God is in the transformation, transformation business. When evil attacks with difficult, God transforms it in a way that brings him glory. So when evil attacks with pain, God uses to build character. When evil gives us resistance, God uses to build strength. When evil attacks with death, God brings life. What life throws at you is not God's will. But God can take you difficult. God can take your difficult and do productive things within you. That is what God does. You can walk in confidence in the Lord. You can say, I don't know what this day is going to bring, but I know that God will bring me through it. I know that there is nothing I am going to face that God cannot handle. I know by the power of God I will be more than a conqueror. Only the power of Christ can bring sweetness out of bitterness, strength out of weakness, triumph out of tra tragedy, and blessing out of heartbreak. God can take what is ugly and make it beautiful. Believe in him. Believe in God. And that is what God is going to do. He doesn't say that all bad things will not happen. They will happen. But my God is able to carry me through them. The good Lord bless you is to think upon these ways, is to meditate upon these ways. And that is the God whom I pray. That is the God whom I save. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. You are God. 
and we are mere human beings. We want to cling to your cross. All on. Father, we thank you. May you continue to bless us, Lord. As we move from one step to another. May you continue to guide us, Lord. As we move in this Christian journey, knowing that our God is there for us. He's not asleep. He's there for us. To help us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I will call Andrew to come and pray for the offerings. Thank you. We bring before you the offering and tithes for today. We'd like to thank you for the blessings that we have received from people. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have blessed us with the treasures of your kingdom. And we offer our response through these gifts of money and the service of our lives. May they be used to sow the seeds of your kingdom values of love, justice and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.